Ladies and gentlemen, it is Wednesday. You know what that means. It is OSA Live. And we are live from the Thunderdome. And when I say the Thunderdome, I really mean we're live from the OSA, uh, the local, the Coventry one. So we're at the big store. I got Ernie with me. We're talking saltwater tonight. And Ernie, what are we talking about saltwater tonight? Uh, tonight, we've already gone over picking out a tank, picking out lighting, picking out fish. Tonight, we're going to go over picking out your first corals, when you should, what type of corals you might want to go with, if you need to feed them or not, just basic things like that. This is for the guys that are just getting started. A lot of you old school guys already know how to do all of this, and when you hear some of the timelines, you're going to be like, I don't want to wait six months to do that. Remember, this is for the new people, okay? And... You, you older folks are welcome to watch as well and throw some comments in there, but this is for the beginners. So come on, hang out. Peter, do me a favor. Hit that intro, baby. Let's dive right into it, baby. So what I did there. Uh, what, what? What is it? So we're getting we're getting a new tank. All right, I just started a new tank. I got this tank up and running. 
It's been going for like two weeks. I, you know, I started with some clownfish. I got a, let's say I got a 50.3 water box, right? I got AI primes, tanks looking pretty good. What are we doing? Uh, you're going to wait about another two weeks. You don't want to really do corals for, for until the first month because your tank is on a constant roller coaster for the first year it's set up. The first month, it's really the parameters are going up and down drastically. So you, at about the one month point, it levels out so you can start with some beginner corals. Almost everyone's first beginner coral is a green star polyps. It's a beautiful coral. It gives you color. It gives you movement. It does have a downside that if you put it on your rock work, sooner or later, all you're going to have in your tank is green star polyps. So we highly recommend you put it on a rock on its own little island in the sand because it has a lot of trouble crossing the sand bed and you can control it there. It's also a very good canary coral. By canary, it lets you know if your tank is ready for other corals or not. If the thing closes up and it doesn't open up for a week or two, you're probably not quite ready yet. But if it's open and flowing around, then you're ready to get into some other easier corals. Even with the GSP too, there's actually multiples of these GSPs. And I got to tell you, my favorite one is this intense lime green branching. That looks pure fire in that display. Uh, me and my friends have actually been keeping that strain alive for almost 26 years now. It started from one little tiny three polyp frag that somebody gave one of my friend's kids because he only had $5 on him and he wanted a coral, so he gave him that. And between five of us, we have kept that strain going for close to 30 years now. And I brought a bunch of it to Chris over at the farm, and now it's in tanks all over New England. And that's a pretty cool thing, in all honesty. Some of the darker green varieties are cool, too. They have white eyes. There's, there's every different color of green star polyp out there. Uh, another great beginner coral, if you want colors and is really, really easy, are mushrooms. Mushrooms come in almost every color out there, and they are about as easy as it gets. Uh, leathers are also another good one, but with leather corals, you want to remember to run activated carbon in your system because they do chemical warfare, and it you can't see that they're doing any harm to your other corals, but they are doing it in the water column. If you run the activated carbon, it takes those chemicals out of the water, and once again, you don't want to run activated carbon in your tank for the first month either. So that's another reason the first month comes up. Now, say I got the GSB. It's in the tank. It is opening. It is flowing. It's looking awesome. I'm ready for more. What's happening? You just said mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people will jump into zoas as well. Zoas are tricky. A lot of people consider them a beginner coral. I do not because some of the most experienced people out there have trouble keeping zoas alive. You need the proper tank for zoas to thrive in. And some zoas get really expensive, like $1,000 a polyp. That, in my mind, is not a beginner coral. Uh, what else is there? Zinnias are another one. I tend to shy away from getting people into zinnias because if a zinnia is doing really well in your tank, it tends to mean you have high nitrates. Zinnias are one of the few corals that actually eat nitrates. And if the zinnia is happy, your other corals probably aren't as happy as they could be. And zinnias will take your tank over. They can, it doesn't always happen, but they can actually break off a piece and wherever it floats to and sticks, just like Kenya trees do. I shy people away from Kenya trees as well because you really can't control those corals. But they are, James actually just hit us up and he said in the comments, What's a good coral to add for a fish only tank? So if you got a fish only with a live rod tank, you, you want to do something different, GSB, Xenia, these are hairy all mushrooms. hairy mushrooms. Those are all great corals because we don't care if the angels eat them, if they pick at them. Nothing will eat a hairy mushroom. It does. And, they, just... and they, they reproduce rapidly. And they look good. I tell people not to put hairy mushrooms in their reef tanks because they will take the tank over. But in a fish only tank, they are perfect because nothing will eat them and your rocks get covered with them and it gives you the, the reef look without having to do the reef care because you don't have to do anything with hairy mushrooms. You put them in there and you let them do their thing. Yeah, and they just grow and they spread out and they look awesome when they cover a rock. 
Okay. Now we're going to be into, we already did the one month. We're going to jump into three months. Three month opens you up a lot more. You can start getting into some of the easier LPSs at that point. I'd still tend to shy away from frog spawns and torches and things like that because they're a little bit more sensitive. And it's hard to tell if you're doing everything right at this point. They need a very stable environment. So you're probably still taking care of your tank by doing water testing and just by doing water changes. When you're doing the frog spawns, the torches and stuff like that, you really want to be doing probably dosing at that point because they suck a lot more out of the water column. By easier LPSs, I mean stuff like trumpet slash candy cane corals, Duncans, things like that. They're not as demanding and they're not as expensive. I'm sure you guys have noticed the prices of hammers and torches and frog spawns now are through the roof. Once again, don't want you spending a lot of money on a coral in the beginning and having it die on you because that's the worst possible scenario. It really upsets you, and you don't want to just throw your money out the window. Wait a little longer. I'd say the six-month area for the torches and the frog spawns. You got anything? No, I mean, for me, I like something like Leptos, Pavona, simple LPSs that look really good there and cross there's to get you going and things, especially like Pavona. Same thing though, you gotta watch where you push that, but that branching, that potato chip one, I think that's such an underrated coral. And then I get into Spastria. There's well. a reason for that. A lot of people look at those and think they're SPS and they just shy away from them right off the bat. The Pavona is just hot. Pavonas, Leptos, they're not SPSs. They are considered LPSs and they are pretty darn easy to take care of. Uh, with the leptos, it's like anything else. The cooler looking the lepto is, the harder it is to take care of. The regular green and orange ones, cakewalk, no problem. And I love color diversity inside the tanks, right? Like we always want different colors, and those lime greens, those oranges, they look so fire. Yeah. And I love when it in a crust over a rock too. That's always the biggest thing is like trying to figure out where you're going to do coral placement. And it's crazy how you can put a coral right here. And it do not so well, but you put a coral right here, and things doing unbelievable. Yep, very true. Uh, another one I forgot in the beginning is anemones. I usually tell everyone wait for the six month mark because your tank is doing that roller coaster of parameters, and anemones are basically ninety nine percent water. So if your water is doing a roller coaster, the anemone is doing a roller coaster. So six months on most anemones. The rock flowers are the exception. You can do rock flowers at that one month mark. They're very similar to mushrooms. They're more of a mushroom than they are an anemone. And that is some outstanding, outstanding color right off the bat. They're very easy to do. They're completely photosynthetic. You don't need to feed them. Uh, that's a great also beginner. It's not a coral. It's an anemone. But that's a good one in the beginning. For me personally, I will always choose leathers. I love leathers, especially when it comes down to our green mamba toadstool and some of the epic simularias, all those different guys, I love when they open up, they flow, and they just they grow quick, and you get a faster instant gratification for that. Now, you got to be careful with the other type of corals you pick and choose. But for me, if I'm already at three months, that's what I'm going to go with next. And the leathers are easy. They're completely photosynthetic. You don't need to feed them. In all honesty, with leathers, you don't really need to pay attention to alkalinity and calcium either. They're, they're almost a fish-only system coral because the parameters don't really matter with them they matter as long as they're close to right but they're not that sensitive uh you can put them anywhere in the tank low light mid light high light low flow mid flow high flow they just they don't mind where you put them and some of them are stunning now say you're at three months right the biggest thing i hear is sometimes like i don't do I dose i don't test my water I don't know what's going on. So if I'm here, I'm going to hear that. That is definitely something like I'm going to always try to get your test listed. If you're doing a solar to reef aquarium, you should be testing. That is just part of the nature. That is the beast. Like I always talk about it. Saltwater, listen, saltwater reef keeping, it's a lifestyle. That's what saltwater reef keeping is. You really want to check on those parameters, especially if you want to get into higher end LPSs. Because one of the biggest corals everyone always wants is hammers, Frogs, bonds, and torches. When would you say that we're ready for that? 
it depends on how long you've been in. If you are new, completely new, I'm going to say probably closer to the six-month area. Because if you are new to this hobby completely, the testing and dosing is going to confuse you a lot in the beginning. It's not that simple. You're doing a lot of math. You've got to figure out how much this tank is using every day. The numbers everybody throws out there, don't chase those numbers. Find out where your tank is good. We tell you like eight and a half alkalinity, 420 to 440 calcium area. That's just an idea. If your tank is consistently running at eight alkalinity and 400 calcium and it is always there, leave it there. Don't change it and try to chase those numbers. Stability is key. And once you figure out the testing and you notice if something is going down more rapidly than others, like alkalinity usually goes down twice as much as calcium does. Alkalinity is the main one you're going to be paying attention to. Then you got to figure out how much of that to dose per day. I highly recommend when you first start dosing for at least the first month or two that you do it manually. Just to make sure your tests are right and you can adjust it easier by doing that. A lot of people will test once, set their automatic doser up and be like, oh, it's on a doser. I don't need to test anymore. I'm good. And either your first test was faulty, and you should never set up a dozer off one test. You should test at least for two solid weeks and find out how much that tank is actually using before you set the dozer up. Because the dozer is putting that in there nonstop, no matter what. And if you dialed in that wrong number, your alkalinity could go to 8 to f up to 15 in a matter of a couple of days. And that corals do not tolerate that. And you're going to see the issues right from that. A lot of times when we see the off issues, um, it's usually your alkalinity, alkalinity things, right? It's usually lighting, flow, alkalinity, and water quality. It's mostly those things. And alk always seems to be the number one cause, especially if you see like reduction in any sort of coral growth or corals that just start bleaching out out of nowhere. So now we're in like six months, right? Am I? Can I just do whatever I want now? That's completely up to you. It's, <laughs> it's your money. Yes. <laughs> what would you choose? When you're... If you, once again, if you are new to this, at six months, you can do pretty much all the corals you want to. You can start getting into the SPSs. I highly recommend your first SPS probably be a purple stylo. Ooh, such a good one. It's a beautiful coral. It's probably the easiest SPS out there. As far as SPSs go, normally the larger the polyps on them, the easier they are to do. If you have success with the stylo, then you can try a Monty cap or something like that and slowly work your way up. Once again, if this is your first time with a saltwater tank, I'm just gonna talk, don't even bother trying acros till the one year mark. It takes a full year for your tank to completely stabilize. And even if your tank is completely stabilized and you're doing everything right, sometimes you still don't have success with acros. And they can be real heartbreakers because they look beautiful one minute and an hour later they're dead. And, oh, and you so trying to figure out what you did wrong and you didn't do anything wrong. That's just how a lot of it works. The acros are all skeleton with a microfilm of living tissue over them. So anything, anything can trigger them to die on you. And we're trying to make you so you're happy with your tank and successful with your tank. There's plenty of SPSs out there that are easy to do. Acros are more for us older guys that have been in for a while and we want a challenge i'm gonna see if i can keep this thing alive see how long i can do it and you grow a colony two years the thing is thriving you go to work you come home nothing has changed in your tank it's dead it's, it's so heartbreaking too and you did nothing wrong it can just things can just change like that so as far as the newer tanks and acropores go as far as new reefers go Wait at least a year, unless you're just a glutton for punishment and want to jump in. Then it's your tank. Do what you want. We're just throwing out some guidelines out there for you. We give these guys give them different things, different products that we use. Also, if you guys that haven't checked out, make sure you guys check us out on osachoice.com. We ship any additives, anything that you guys need right to your door. And if you got a chance, hit that video for us.
Alrighty, guys, if you have any questions, make sure to hit us up in that comment section. We're going to go through it in a little bit and just at, answer all those questions. Actually, since Jay has just got one pulled up right here, he wants to know, have you guys heard of growing pulsing xenia in your sumps for nutrient export instead of ma uh, macro allergies? Could you be interesting thing to try? I actually personally tried this myself. It worked very well till the zinnia got, it started growing like crazy. And then it started disconnecting and it started going through my pumps and getting shot back into the system. And it was a mess, but it did a really, really good job of taking nitrates out of the water column. And it looked really cool too. You open up your sump and there's just the entire sump is pulsing. It's, it does look it's awesome. Cool, I see it but it does time. have its downsides. As long as you have a very good sponge in between your refugium compartment and your return pump, it shouldn't be a problem because it's not going to backflow to the skimmer compartment. I was one of those guys that got tired of cleaning that bubble trap sponge out and took it out, and that's why it got through into my pumps. And it was kind of my own fault. Just for the record. Now, Ernie, we got a what does Chris got here? How about Ganapora? Same as Acro? Ghanis will do well, but you need to feed them at least twice a week. If you do not feed a Ghani at least twice a week, it's going to last about six months at best. And they, then they just go into shutdown. And not, some Ghanis will go into shutdown after six months anyway. Ghanis are tough. If you like the Ghanapora look, go with the Olivia Pora. Uh, it is there's a much awesome. easier coral. And it actually comes in nicer colors than the Ghanaporas do as well. Olivia Poras, I feed at least once a week. It's they're much easier. All right, so we got the coral. I bought the coral. Now, what are we getting into? The first thing you need to do when you get your coral home, no matter where you buy it from, even if your best friend gives it to you and he's got the nicest looking tank on the planet, you need to dip your corals when you get home. Behold the dips that we use. You have them backwards. Uh, it's totally <laughs> fine. I got it. I got, I got, I'm totally messing this up. Yeah, all right. The best one out there for strictly dipping is the Coral RX right here. This our go-to. This stuff is awesome. Takes care of any pests that come in. It, it works really, really, really well. If you get into fragging or any, if you can't find the Coral RX, the second one to go to is the Coral Revive. This is more than just a dip. This also cleans the coral and helps it heal. So if you just frag the coral, you dip it in this, and it helps the coral out a lot. It will also help take care of pests. Just make sure wherever you get your corals from, you dip them. Especially, hopefully, the shows are coming back. I really think they're coming back this year. If the shows come back, have a gallon of this on hand. Because the stuff you get from the shows, a lot of it's straight from the ocean. And there's some dirty, dirty stuff out there. There's a lot of clean stuff, too. But a lot of the stuff... Guys, pick it up at the airport, bring it to the show. The thing was in the ocean 24 hours ago. So you've got to dip that stuff. It's a necessity. Because once that stuff gets in your tank, whether it's Monty Nudies, which are the worst things on the worst. planet, or red bugs or flatworms, you don't want to deal with that stuff down the road. Just It's easier to take care of off the bat. Inspect the plug also after you dip it to make sure there's no eggs on there. These dips will kill whatever pest there is but it does not kill the, the eggs. eggs and the eggs are usually pretty visible and you can scrape them off if there's any eggs on there. Jay just set us up direct feed the Ghanis or is broadcast feeding. Okay. Also a recommendation of foods for that. We are getting to that we, and you should direct feed everything, everything, everything you should target. Feed. We do broadcast feed, but especially when it comes to the Ghanis, most of those LPSs you really want to target feed. But first, before we jump into that, Want to get into these? We have to get into these because this is step two. Step two, ladies and gentlemen. Now, how do you attach your coral once you get it out of the dip and you get it home? If you bought an enormous, enormous colony, which they're hard to find nowadays, and you want to put it on your rock work, that's when the coral creek comes in handy. Other than that, just use the gelled reef glue. Yeah, this is our go-to. The gelled reef glue works on almost anything, and it's so much easier to use in the coral creek. But like I said, for a huge colony, the coral creek's the way to go. Yeah, just so you can place it and go on to it. Now we're getting out of the foods. Oh, so many choices. And when I say so many choices, <laughs> you know I'm going to give you my top favorite choice. 
Do you want me to pull out the food first? You want to do acro power? What do you want to do? Let's do the acro power. All righty then. I feel like Vanna White right now. Yes. Hey. Now the acro power is an amino acid. It's very similar to the Red Sea A and B, which a lot of you guys use. This is where it gets confusing with the broadcast feeding. A lot of y'all think you're feeding your corals with the Red Sea A and B or the acro power. The amino acids are actually trigger, triggering a feeding response in them. That's why you dump that into the water system and let it go around. All the corals saturated in, and in about 20 minutes, that's when you go around and you target feed your corals because it has triggered their feeding response and their polyps are out and they are ready to eat. Acro power is pretty cool too because you can hook it up to a doser. It's All the few... rest of them need to be refrigerated. Yeah. Acro power, you can put on a doser if you want to. That's actually why we use this one so much because you don't need to refrigerate it. Our go to coral food Dun -dun -dun -dun! is a coral max. I personally used to use Reefroids a lot. Coral max is very similar to Reefroids, but I see a much better feeding response out of Coral max. Reefroids is awesome as well. They are both very good, both very similar. They're both powdered. You mix them up the same way with a little bit of your tank water, mix them together, and you take a pipe back, and you go around and you target feed all your corals. The problem with just broadcast feeding coral food, anything you put in your tank, you have got to take out of your tank. you got to remember that. If you dump a big bunch of this in there, okay, your corals are happy. They just ate. Three quarters of that's still floating around in your rocks and your sand bed. It's in your sump. It's, it's like the overflow. It's, You're banking on that protein it's skimmer. Like it's like dumping and an enormous bucket of phosphates into your tank. So if you dump a bunch of coral food in there, you got to dump a bunch of GFO in your reactor to get all those phosphates out. It's so much easier to target feed than it is the broadcast feed. It's way easier. It's, the only time we really get into broadcast feeding is if uh, nutrients. We're not having enough nutrients in the tank, and that's something we get to. But normally, you're not running into that, especially if you're, you're new to it and you're just getting into it, and it's easier more controlled. And different type of tools for those target feedings. Smaller tank, you got the small pipe bed. The big old deep tanks, you got the big pipe bed. If you don't mind your arm getting wet, use the small one all the time. You can really, really get where you need to get with it. But you got a three foot deep tank, you want the bigger plate back because I don't think you want to go swimming to feed those guys on the bottom. Especially the guys that have like 150 tall, so the 110s. You can go through and just kind of pick out and choose. Oh, I'm going to get that Connie over there in the corner. Oh, got to get that torch over there. You have more work with this. A lot of the LPSs. The bigger LPSs will eat bigger food, too. You can squirt some lysis on them, some brine on them. Some of them will even, like, scolies and stuff, will even eat pellets. It's It depends on what you want to do, but I always recommend that you target feed them because you're just not wasting the food in the water column. That is true. That's a very good true. Um, and say if I was using different types of foods and stuff like that, now do you suggest feeding every single coral? Or are you suggesting just like more like branching style, like uh, like all species, like donnies, torches? A ton of corals are completely photosynthetic. Like cl even clams. Clams, once they get over two inches, they're totally photosynthetic. You don't need to feed them anymore. A lot of anemones out there. The only anemones you really, really need to feed are the really big ones, like the carpets and the condies. Yeah, throw a silver side in there. They'll gobble it up. You throw a silver side and a bubble tip, Half of it's going to rot in its gut. The other half is going to spit out, and that's going to be floating around your tank. If the clownfish are in the anemone, the clownfish are bringing it food anyway. Um, I personally have never fed a bubble tip anemone, and I have had great success with pretty much every species of bubble tip that's out there, from the really, really expensive ones to the cheapest little green one you've ever seen. I've never fed any of them. It's... There's also corals that a lot of us don't even realize are out there. They're called the, N the NPSs, the non-photosynthetics. Those, you've got to be dedicated. You've got to feed those every day. It's A lot of guys get tricked into buying these beautiful gargonians. If a gargonian's got white or blue polyps, don't even bother. It's, it's not going to live unless you basically have it living in a tank full of phytoplankton. If it has brown polyps on it, it's photosynthetic. You don't need to feed that thing. Sun corals are another one. You've got to feed them every day. That is a tough coral, too. Like, 
the spot it's going to go into choosing it. I mean, we all love that coral because it's so bright and vibrant, but you've got to be so careful with it. The beauty of the sun coral is you can train it. If it's at your work desk and you're at work every day and you're looking at that tank, a sun coral might be for you because you're bored anyway. You look over at it and you feed it. If you're on your lunch break and you want to feed that coral at noon every day, mix up a bunch of coral food in a little bowl, put that coral in that bowl every single day at noon for a week, and all of a sudden that coral starts opening at noon every single day in your tank, and you just squirt food on it and it's good to go. They're beautiful corals. They're hard to take care of. Eric, do you guys like to switch out foods and get some diversity, or do you like to stick with the same food for consistency? Uh, pretty much coral wise, I stick with the same food. My fish are spoiled. They get something different almost every day, but corals, I don't think they have the same taste and feeding response and everything else. I think once you find a food that works, continue using that food. For food wise, that too. Plus remember we're feeding frozen foods throughout the tanks for the fish. So you're getting other pieces right that from the inside there and just and fish waste, fish and, waste. And, but for us, the go-to is the Coral Max. That's in our main one for it. Anything else you want to add in tonight? I think we covered anything. If we forgot anything, shout it out to us. It's <laughs> Guys, we appreciate all the comments. We appreciate you guys joining us. Uh, what's going on this week here at the store? Uh, I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> we got brand new tanks coming in. Anybody that's looking for tanks, especially the big ones. The 154 footers, the 156 footers, 225s, 210s. We're going to be loading up Coventry and some of the other stores this week. So you'll start seeing some bigger tanks. We haven't really had any of the bigger ones available. That will start rolling in so you see different tanks available. Guys, we appreciate you hanging out with us. Next week, we're talking fresh water, bringing in fresh water to go. If you guys have any comments or questions, hit us up in the comment section. And also, it helps us out bringing up any sort of content for you guys that you're looking for, whether you're on Facebook or whether you're on YouTube. If the airlines cooperate, we have got a massive, massive amount of salt and fresh water coming in. So many fish. I'm going to tell you guys right if now. If the airlines cooperate. We have so many. I totally overdid it. When I say overdid it. I'm in trouble. The amount of fish that are going to be inside this building and going to all the stores. All right, just to give you guys an example, fresh water, we have 27 boxes landing tomorrow. Salt water, we have an additional 20 boxes. And I then think it's 25. 25 boxes. And then Sunday night, we have another 22 and, oh, and, boxes. And coral. Oh, yeah, and coral's coming in tomorrow, too. Yeah. So we're just going to be like, listen. I, if you come into the store tomorrow, forgive me if I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off. I'm going to have a very busy day tomorrow. So The last two <laughs> weeks, we haven't been able to get anything because of the air flights and everything else but i'm telling you this weekend it is going to be absolutely packed i'm looking forward to it actually can't wait all right guys we're getting out of here we appreciate you guys hanging out let's join joseph and myself next week we're talking fresh water we'll see you guys then keep on reaching that bit. Woo! Woo!